Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today um, on this SAT interview. On this occasion, we have the opportunity of having the Minister of Zimbabwe, Minister of Finance, Professor Amtuli Mube. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to dive straight into our first question for today. And uh, the first question that we have is um, in the Second Republic. Um, what would you say um, are the highlights of um, particularly the ministry or the republic itself? Are there are many areas that I would consider to be uh, really a success for the Second Republic, uh, things that I believe uh, really will move the country forward uh, towards Vision 2030, that of becoming an upper middle income economy by that year. Uh, if you look at, for instance, on the macroeconomic front, we've had very successful uh, fis uh, fiscal consolidation agenda, which has allowed us to manage things within our means, to live within our means in terms of government resources. And in so doing, we've been able to create extra room that has allowed us to invest in infrastructure. So we've not only have had prudent uh, fiscal management, but as well as created room for investing in, in, in infrastructure in ways that has never happened before. We're funding roads with our own resources, uh, dams, and all manner of other projects that, that we, we've been able to fund as a result of, uh, of those resources, including the acquisition of vaccines, which would not be, been be possible if we hadn't conducted that kind of fiscal consolidation. That, that, so that's clearly one area of, of success. Then staying with the macro side, again, the introduction of the Zimbabwe dollar is also a very successful project. Of course, it's never easy to stabilize a new currency and we have been uh, uh, you know, uh, dealing, with, dealing with that, but it's there, it has introduced competitiveness in our industry. Capacity utilization is at its highest level in 30 years, easily. Uh, uh, that, that has worked very well. I, I won't leave out uh, agriculture. I think that the success of the Fumvudza Intuasa program uh, uh, and also the success of the commercial program, uh, these are speak for themselves. Last year, we had perhaps the best agricultural season uh, since 1981. This is in, 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 in 40 years. And this year, again, it looks looking like, uh, unless something else happens, well, for the first time in 20 years, we'll be self-sufficient in wheat, mm -hmm. where we expect to produce about 383,000 metric tons of wheat compared to domestic consumption of about 360,000 metric tons. So that's clearly a success area in the agricultural sector. And we were keen to revive uh, the, the, uh, the horticulture industry and support it uh, so that it goes back to its uh, glory uh, days. Um, if you look at the tourism sector, of course, COVID has been, has been, has been unkind to the yes, sector. To the uh, uh, but again, we are having you know, uh, good investments in the sector right across the country. You go to Victoria Falls, I don't know when you were last there, you see that there is some buoyancy there. Uh, also in Victoria Falls, in terms of the financial service sector, we've launched an offshore financial center. We have actually launched a second stock exchange called the Victoria Falls Stock Exchange, which only trades in US dollars. We have four counters at, at, at the moment, uh, three in the mining sector and one in the uh, general export sector, although there's a bit of mining in it, which is uh, uh, Padenga. So, so I'll say there are many areas of, of, of success. I mean, you look at the whole devolution agenda. It has been a game changer, building schools, uh, clinic, uh, you know, roads at the local level, that devolution agenda where we allocate 5% of the national budget towards the, the, the 10 right. provinces, that, that, that has been a, a, a game changer. But, but really, uh, you look at our universities, there's been a, a massive transformation towards universities that you know, drive innovation, uh, universities that uh, you know, produce knowledge, that produces you know, goods and services. Every university uh, uh, owned by the state has some innovation hub. Mm -hmm. And we're very impressed as a government, as a progress uh, made by those universities in producing goods and services. If you think of the area of, of, of uh, COVID response where, and PPP uh, you know, uh, production, universities led the production of masks, of sanitizers in Zimbabwe, which were, were deployed uh, for usage in the, in the public sector. Even these high schools, high schools, fashion and fabric departments were making uh, masks. So, so really, I, I, I'm very pleased with what we've achieved in the Second Republic yes, and continue to, to push forward towards that vision of, of being an upper middle income society by year 2030. So we're still on track? We're still on track. Okay, thank you. Um, the way that you answered your, my question, you actually delved into what I was about to ask you in the second question, but I'll still go right ahead and ask um, mm. part of that question which was not answered. Um, 
looking at your pronouncements since you came in as the Minister of Finance, mm -hmm. you've been speaking of um, the reduction of uh, one ton expenditure. And of course, here and there we've had you announce in places, um, uh, should I call uh, fiscal excess, or um, you have been within the budget. And in some cases, I remember reading somewhere that the Treasury was announcing um, um, an excess figure of six billion Zimbabwe dollars at some point. I think that's around February of this year. Now, part of the question that you did not answer me is um, we have people that are always clamoring and asking, is it proper to keep those zeros on paper or should we be deploying them to, for instance, reducing, reducing the internal debt or infrastructure that you spoke of, as I said, you've already answered part of the question. But some are even asking, uh, why not we, for instance, maybe increase be it staff salaries or people get the sense that if there's excess, that means there's nothing to do, it's just floating money. What do you say of that question? Uh, we're, we're using these resources to finance roads, to uh, build hospitals. I talked about vaccine acquisition. Uh, recently, we increased salaries, and that's what exactly what we've done. It's exactly where you think you are, you are, you are suggesting that we should be applying these, these, these resources. That's exactly what, what we are doing. Mm -hmm. The point is that we have, uh, uh, you know, a capacity to use our own resources to support our own development. That's really the message. Okay. Uh, thank you for the response. Now, you understand we're holding this discussion in the backdrop of um, a sudden surge in our inflation numbers. The last announcement I think was about 191%. Mm -hmm. And um, just this Monday on the 27th of June, you came up with the raft of measures that you announced to, to the public, I'm sure, to try and arrest that situation. Mm -hmm. um, my question is simple. Do you think you've done adequately enough with those measures that you announced to, to curb this ever-increasing uh, inflation number? Now, the, the inflation figures in Zimbabwe uh, or rather the inflation, where, where does it come from? It comes from mainly two sources. The, the first one is external. So 60% of Zimbabwe's inflation is externally derived, it's imported inflation, which is arising out of, I would say, the, the three Fs, food, uh, fuel, and fertilizer channels. And every country in the world is facing the probably the highest inflation it has faced in 40 years. In this country, in the UK, where we are today, it is facing the highest inflation in 40 years. In, in, in the U.S., uh, again, with inflation at almost 9% or so, it is also facing the highest inflation in 40 years since 1982. And I remember those figures very uh, vividly. Now, now, every other country is facing a similar situation. So we're not different. Yeah, for, for the fact that, it's, not fact that it's, not to it's not unique to Zimbabwe that we're suffering uh, from high inflation. 60% is imported inflation through fuel, and we've done quite a bit to try to ameliorate the sharp increase in fuel by play, playing around with the, the um, reducing the, uh, the, the uh, um, fuel duties. So which we have, by the way, for diesel, we've reduced to zero cents. No tax. Yeah, no tax now. For, for petrol, we've reduced it from 12.7 cents down to 4.7 cents. So again, we've reduced just to ameliorate that sharp increase in, in, in fuel prices. That's just one area mm. in terms of inflation mitigation that, that we've been uh, institution, uh, instituting as a country. Mm. I talked about 60% of the inflation being external. Mm. I'm further explaining that. Mm. Now, 40% is, is really domestic being driven by the power market. So the power market pricing behavior in the market, arbitrage behavior in the market, and some indiscipline is driving a, a part of that inflation. And the two together are then responsible for overall inflation. So it's, it's become necessary, therefore, for us to push up the costs of uh, speculation domestically. So raising interest rates 200% in the face of inflation, which is 192% uh, around about, uh, is really designed to, to deal with that, to deal with that inflation pressure and to make sure that we, we can, for, for the first time, get a, a positive real interest rate, or at least, at least a zero real interest rate, which is the interest rate minus inflation. In the past, we've had negative interest rate. That's free money yeah. for speculators to then borrow easily and speculate uh, on the currency, but also on the stock market. So these, these, these measures have been necessary to really deal with the, uh, 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 the cost of speculation, to raise the cost of, of, of speculation. The pronouncements around making sure that uh, uh, you know, agents understand that for, for a while, we will have a, a multi-currency regime 
uh, largely uh, being driven by the duality between the US dollar and the Zimbabwe dollar. Yes. Those are the two dominant uh, currencies. And mind you, the, the currency that is most in circulation in Zimbabwe is actually the Zimbabwe dollar, okay. it's not the US dollar. Uh, if you look at the bank deposits, uh, you know, 60% at least is Zimbabwe dollar, 40% is US dollar. If you look at the, our, our inflows as government in terms of taxes, 30% of the taxes are US dollars, 70% are in Zimbabwe dollars. So it's clear that Zimbabwe dollar is still the dominant uh, currency just in terms of uh, the, 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 those words. But we had to provide certainty that citizens know, economic agents should know, investors should know that we'll continue with this regime for at least currency regime, uh, at least for the five years under the NDS one period, to provide a sense of certainty, a sense of direction, and also to, to make sure that we sub it's clear what currency regime supports the National Development Strategy one. Okay, um, as a follow-up question to what you've just told me, um, we, the ministry increased the bank policy rates to 200%. Oh, Central Bank, Reserve Bank, Central Reserve Bank yes. Reserve Bank. Mm -hmm. And uh, with what you've just told me, most economists are then, economists are then coming with suggestion that maybe the, the, the authorities should have gone further and increased the statutory reserve from 10% for, for coal and other accounts and 2% for savings to further dry the market and mop up any excess liquidity. Don't you think that was going to help the situation in the economy? Oh, we could have done a, a lot of other things, which I cannot obviously mention you know here. Uh, mention here because we are, those are in our back pocket okay. uh, 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 look there's not nothing to stop us from doing exactly that in future mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that we can mop up excess liquidity uh, uh, from from the market but we have chosen not to do so uh, because we believe that the just a hike in interest rates for now is quite a you know a, 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 a sharp instrument uh, let's see how that works if we feel that we need to institute other measures yes. we'll consider that uh, going forward Ab absolutely uh, uh, but there are other measures, of course, that we could consider. Policies are exactly about that. You put in a policy, mm -hmm. and if it, if, if, if it doesn't work as well, you make sure that you strengthen it or, or, or supplant it or adjust with something else. That's normal policy making. Okay. Um, my last question for today is more of a suggestion than a question. Um, Zimbabwe uses the tax system, the source tax system, instead mm -hmm. of uh, the residence tax system. But mm -hmm. the way the world is going, people are now working online, earning income from elsewhere, or mm -hmm. holding businesses that are well, transnational, going beyond national geographic borders. Mm -hmm. Is it no time that we rethink and relook at our tax system and move it away from the source taxing and go take it maybe to the residence taxing, where mm -hmm. at least we manage to, to, to widen the net? Because you get people who are earning, they might be in Gweri, Narari, Masuingo, but they're earning income from here in the UK, mm -hmm. forever. Mm -hmm. is, there, is it not a good suggestion to relook really look at our tax system? Mm. Look, our tax system will continue to evolve. Yeah, you're right that this is worth looking into more you know, uh, systematically. Uh, but I think that if we're looking at the diaspora, last year the diaspora brought in about 1.4 billion. US dollars in terms of remittances into the economy uh, to support their families, to invest, to do all manner of things. And that is welcome. So in a way, they are contributing already the uh, through the, the economy. It's one of the reasons why we have a current account uh, uh, surplus. The remittances are a part of that story. So I feel that they're doing quite a lot. I don't think we're about thinking about following them uh, you know, where they live, into Australia, into the UK, and say, uh, pay your uh, taxes. Uh, we think that for now, the remittances are a good enough contribution into the economy. I think what we really would look at going forward is to structure some instrument, let's say diaspora bonds. And if it will be in the market in the next few months with a hard US dollar bond, that we will be you know, speaking to the diaspora about, about investing in back in their country through an instrument and not just through remittances to the family. You, you, you can imagine a structure like uh, this one, Dube, where you, uh, someone could invest in a bond uh, and then the interest, uh, which is uh, the Generate. coupon generated every quarter, is then passed on to the family. So they only have to invest once, once. but the, the coupons or the, the interest is what, would, or, or is what then supports the family. the family. That's a better way to be sending remittances as well back home. So those are some of the things that we're looking at. Uh, we hadn't really uh, gone as far as taxing, wanting to tax the, the diaspora. I think for now they're contributing enough. But it's a thought, and why not going forward? Those are some of the things we could, uh, we could look into. I wish we could have you for beyond the questions that have been, I've asked you today, but uh, I'm sure for constraints of your time, we're going to end it here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, listening and following us today. Uh, this was a SATS interview. My name is Atmaya Maparanza Dube, Dr. Dube.
Thank you. Signing out.